with us. We're so glad you're here. We, so, we are so glad that you have chosen to spend time with us this morning. If you're watching online, uh, whether that be through Facebook or YouTube, we would love to hear from you. Just go ahead and drop a comment below. Hit the blue thumbs up and like and follow us on Facebook so you can keep up with us there. If you're on YouTube, click the red subscribe button. It'll be right under the name of the church. And please share us with your family and friends as well. If you're new to Roy Christian Church and you haven't texted one of the key words right behind me from the Listen or Bulletin, you can text the line 385-217-8399. Do that to, uh, before you leave today so that we can stay in touch. You can either send a text to Loop, Hello, online, whatever you're interested in. At our website, which is www.roychristian.org, not too hard to remember, you can register or to receive our weekly electronic newsletter, which is sent out on Wednesdays. Uh, you can submit prayer requests on there, see the church calendar, and learn much more about us. Our Wednesday night potluck is at 545, and usually I look forward to potlucks, but this week it's a, it's a brinner, so it's a breakfast for dinner. I'm not a huge breakfast fan, but I'm sure a lot of you are, so bring your best breakfast plates at 545 this Wednesday, and we'll also be having classes for all ages, including our youth group. The folks in our Thursday night Bible study are continuing their study of the life of King David. You are also invited to an open house... Uh, in the fellowship hall, which is right out there, today, right after the service, from noon to 1.30, to celebrate Joan Ferdern's 80th birthday. Happy birthday, Joan. Please come visit with Joan and her family. You don't need to bring any gifts. The pleasure of your company is gift enough. Mark your calendars for Trunk or Treat this Saturday, October 29th. Um, there's still a couple of details for the Trunk or Treat. We need a few more storytellers, so if that is something you're interested in, please um, sign up for that. There's a sign-up sheet right outside on the table. Um, we will have three. We need three more pre-decorated trunks. Um, if you are going to be attending that, please arrive at 1:30 to set up your trunk before the trick-or-treaters get there. And we are still collecting candy, so if you would like to give some candy for the kiddos, please do so. You can just drop them off at the counter right outside the, the hallway right there. Next Sunday, there will be a potluck lunch slash supper to show appreciation to our pastors. We'll have a corner set up for some photos, as well as a place to drop cards and leave notes if you would like to do that. The morning bulletin, which is in the chair pockets around there, the little tiny folders, um, has a summary of all the prayer requests shared this past week in our prayer train. <coughs> if you have requests or praises, share them with our team at prayer at roychristian.org or using the link to our website, as I mentioned. So here are some of the prayer requests from this past week. Molly Mackey has been in the hospital at Ogden Regional this week, so be sure to be continuing to pray for her. The mother of Jin Nadu's co-worker, Scott, fell and broke her ankle. He has gone to California to be with her, so pray for healing and peace of mind through that. Two Siskiyou's surgery went well. We actually had an update on that this morning. Um, 12 lymph nodes were removed and zero cancer seen in any of the lymph nodes. So praise God for that. There's no follow-up treatment required. So let's pray together just to open our morning. Lord, thank you so much for just the blessing of this day, God. We're so grateful that we get to join together as a church family and just learn, learn more about you, get to know you better, and just praise you for who you are. Please just remind us today of how, how just heavily blessed we are that no matter what we're facing, you have blessed us astoundingly. Please just remind us of that today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would like to give a gift today, you can put it in an envelope from a chair pocket near you, or you can drop it in the boxes in the back doors as you leave. Thank you guys for continuing to support God's kingdom and our ministry here at Roy. If you're a guest, if you're new to this church, there is no expectation or requirement that you give. Also, there are Bibles available in the church pockets, and Paul urged Timothy, he said, work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed, and one who correctly explains the word of truth. That's 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. We all need to be able to handle God's true word of truth. So if you need a Bible, please take one as our gift to you. Now at this time, I'd like to invite Lead Pastor James Sayers up for the sermon of today.
Can I tell you how weird it is and how awesome it is all at the same time to be on the front row instead of up here for the whole thing? Woo! That is great. I'm glad Zach is here. Uh, I hope you are too. It makes me smile a lot more, which I know many of you feel like I should do that more often anyway. So um, you should keep Zach very, very happy, uh, and that'll make me happy too. Um, I do want to... Uh, uh, to make note of a couple of things here, um, the next Sunday, the potluck is at 5.30. Um, there is a, has been a suggestion that you should talk to me or to Zach or to Jen and find out what all of our favorite things are, and you should bring those. If you want to do that, great. Just, just know that, um, you know, there's only two kinds of pie that are acceptable, hot and cold. So beyond that, whatever... <laughs> Whatever you bring will be lovely. Um, we're going to have a place for you to take some pictures with us. I, I realized at the end of my first ministry, um, you know, 20 years ago, um, that after 10 years of ministry there, there were no photos, really, of me with anybody from church. Uh, I was either taking the pictures of the youth group or the church event, uh, or somebody, for some reason, took a picture of me doing something on my own. So I'd like to have some pictures with, with you all. So um, bring your cameras. We'll have a, a spot set up. Um, Zach and Jen and I are going to be working this week for a couple other special things, maybe to entice you to come back and join us at 530. Um, I don't know if it'll be like two truths and a lie or, you know, guess the pastor or something like that, but we promise to make it worth your while. Uh, we, we hope you'll come and, uh, and join us for that. Uh, I should also mention that we do have a number of um, out-of-town guests with us, um, visiting family. Um, the Rotes have got some out-of-town family here this morning. Um, Joan has uh, two and a half rows of family visiting for her birthday celebration uh, today and tomorrow. Um, as a part of that extended family, let me say one more time, I hope you'll stick around. Even if you just come through, give her a hug. Um, and uh, steal a cupcake, that is uh, that would be awesome too. We'd love to have you come. Uh, she really wants to show off her family. So please come and be in awe of, of all of us. Would you, uh, would you please? So uh, in our sermon series, uh, we have been working through um, a, a couple different aspects. We've been talking about hope now for the last uh, month or so, and we, um, we've we been specifically focusing on hope in the book of Romans uh, during the month of October. Um, in Paul's letter to the Romans, he talks about and encourages the people uh, with hope in several passages. Um, we have talked about the hope that we have in the resurrection, uh, we have talked about the hope that we have in the unlimited, incredible power of God. Uh, we've talked about the hope that we have in, uh, in certainty of being at peace with him. And uh, last week, Zach talked about uh, the, uh, the hope that we have in the glory of heaven coming to us, um, hopefully someday soon. In a time where there is so much chaos and so much despair, so much surrender, uh, we desperately all need hope. Uh, and we've said that hope is that joyful and confident expectation of God's promises to us. He who promised is faithful, and we cling um, to the promise of that fulfillment um, very soon. The sermon text for this morning is really just one sentence. Uh, it comes from Romans chapter 15, verse 4, and by the time you turn there, I'll be done. So just write it down, Romans 15, verse 4. Um, there, Paul writes to the, the church in Rome and says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the Scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. Everything that's written is provided so that we, we might have hope. Paul is writing to these Christians in Rome. They are both Jews and Gentiles. If you read through the rest of the letter, a lot of it has to do with uh, sort of unfolding um, the, the old covenant, the, the, uh, the, the, the first covenant with God's people, and what it looks like now that Jesus has come. <clears throat> uh, but he's writing to make sure that Jew and Gentile alike, so that's everybody, understands that the collection of Scripture at, at that point, which is Genesis to Malachi, 
what we call the Old Testament is both meaningful and beneficial to those people who are in the new covenant with Christ Jesus. We're no longer um, bound to follow the law, but we are dependent on God's, God's grace. That's what we're, we're banking on. Actually, Paul says, the ancient texts were deliberately planned and penned in order that the church could be strengthened and kept healthy. It's a similar idea to one that he writes in, uh, in uh, a letter to Timothy in chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. There he says, all scripture is God-breathed, and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God breathed out his word into those who wrote down scripture so that we could have everything that we need all the time. We don't have to go someplace special to find it. We don't have to make a trek or a pilgrimage to a, a certain place, but we have God's revealed word with us all the time. We can always know what his will is. So let's take a few moments this morning to sort of dissect this, uh, this verse, Romans 15, 4, to see what Paul says about God's revealed word. The first thing that he lets us know is that God's word is our teacher. The word is our teacher. Uh, I liked school a lot. I enjoyed going all the time. I had teachers that I loved dearly. I don't know who your favorite teacher was. Maybe it was um, uh, uh, grade school, middle school, high school, even a college professor. Was it the teacher who was really easily distracted, who told great stories? Maybe your favorite teacher was the one who had virtually no homework and always gave everybody easy A's. Or maybe it was the teacher who made a lasting difference in your identity and in your character. My bet is it's number three. A teacher who may have pushed really hard, who didn't give up on you, who kept forcing you to take the next step to become all that God designed you to be. God gives us his word to be our teacher, not to give just great stories or to give us uh, a, a really easy pass in life, but to be changed. We are taught these lessons in Scripture so that we learn something. Not just so we, that we know a few stories or that we can recite a few passages, but so that we can actually learn something about God's will for us and for the rest of the world. Uh, in 1 Timothy 4, verse th uh, 13, uh, Paul says to Timothy to give attendance or to give thought and effort to reading, exhortation, and doctrine. Essentially, he says that, that the teaching that God's word gives to us should make a difference in our behavior, in our speech, in our attitude. We don't want to just read through scripture and go, I don't know what that was about. I got no clue. I don't speak that language. I don't know what they're saying. But we're need, we need to be reading it deeply enough, working at it hard enough to really own whatever that truth is, um, to, to take the challenge of it uh, and to make that a part of our everyday lives, behavior, speech, attitude, and our priorities. Paul talks about that uh, in another passage. He says, you, you however... Know all about my teaching. It's the same word that he uses here. All about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, patience, love, and endurance, persecutions and sufferings, what kind of things happened to me, the persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. There's a verse we don't preach much while evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, 
Paul says. Continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And then again he says there in 2 Timothy 3, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God's Word is our teacher. It provides lessons so that we can be changed, that all the aspects of our life are altered, that we grow, we develop, we mature, we, we stretch, we're challenged. If, if you're reading God's Word and you don't come away from thinking, oh, what? <sighs> that's, that's rough, I'm going to need to make a change then I think you need to go back and read that again. Those stories are there to help us understand that we need God to grow. The Word is our teacher. And the lesson, Paul says, is endurance. Endurance is the lesson. There's an expectation in teaching that, that things will change. It's not just about, is this going to be on the test? Do we have to know this later? Am I ever going to use this? The answer is always, yes, you will use this when we read God's word. But the lessons, Paul says, are given so that, or in order that. That means there is a reason that these things are coming along. If, he says, if we want to have hope in this world, then we have to know what God's word says. God's word has been given us for a reason. We have it so that we can have hope. Not just hope for a life that's going to come. Not just hope for salvation eventually. But God's word is given to us so we can have hope every single day in this life as well. The Bible teaches us lessons about endurance and perseverance. On our Thursday night uh, study, we've been looking at the life of David, um, the the young shepherd who was anointed to be Israel's king, uh, who waited and waited and waited after that promise was given to him. But he didn't just sit back and relax easily. It was not just a life of ease waiting for that promise to be fulfilled. His life was full of incredible frustration and significant obstacles and life-threatening danger. From the time that he was anointed by Samuel in Bethlehem to be the next king of Israel, um, ab about a dozen years passed until he took the throne from King Saul. And again, none of that time was easy. The promise is, David, you will be the king. You will reign on the throne of Judah and Israel. And for the next dozen years or so, David was either waging war against God's enemies, mostly the Philistines, or he was fleeing from the current king, Saul, who was trying with all of his power to kill David, to hunt him down like a dog and end his life. David could easily have said, you know what, God, I appreciate the offer to be the king, but this is way too hard. I do not need to be running around here in the wilderness trying to save my neck. I can just go back to take care of the sheep. I can fight bears and wolves. I cannot fight this political stuff. But David didn't do that. We would understand if David quit. It is a lot. He's being tracked down. But David never lost sight of what God promised. He just kept trusting the Lord to work out the plan. It was his plan. It was his promise. David just needed to be faithful and trusted to bring it about. When we read Old Testament stories like that of David and hundreds of other characters, we see God's justice. We see his faithfulness to Israel. Even when, or especially when, Israel was totally fickle and absolutely faithless. But God's faithfulness reinforces our 
confident, joyful expectation in his promises that he makes to us and all the rest of Scripture. If he can deal with Israel, who was close and far, close and far, over and over again, this horrible cycle of rebellion and repentance. If God can be faithful to them and bring about his promises, absolutely he can be faithful to us. He will be. We can be patient and we can endure whatever comes. Our hope, our expectation of salvation and an eternity with God is strengthened when we read these stories, when we take home that lesson to persevere. Perseverance is the characteristic of one who is unswerved by their deliberate purpose and their loyalty to their faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings. No matter what comes, perseverance says, I will not stop. I will not let go. In the New Testament, James tells us that the testing of faith brings about perseverance and that perseverance brings about maturity. If we will ever grow up in our faith, if we will ever cultivate the relationship that we have with God, then we have to go through whatever comes. We have to allow God to develop us through the highs and the lows of life. And in case you're not fully aware of this yet, much more character building, much more spiritual development happens in the lows and the depths of pain and despair than it does up in the clouds of, and the mountaintop of, of blessing. Paul has written, we, we touched on it here just a minute ago, that everyone who wants to live a godly life will be persecuted. You want to be faithful to Christ? You're going to face opposition. You will be ridiculed. You will be mocked. You will be cast aside. You will be ignored. You may be arrested. You may be killed for your faith. But, he says, as for you, stay the course. No matter how things appear to be going for those who are God's enemies, you continue in what you've learned Grab a hold of those lessons and do not let go. You have been persuaded. You have been convinced that, that God is with you, that he's going to keep his promises. Don't let go of that. In Revelation 13 uh, and 14, uh, there is uh, one uh, phrase that appears twice uh, that I don't know that I'd ever really paid attention to uh, before this week. 13.10 and 14.12 um, say, uh, say to us, this calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. That's Revelation 13.10. And in 14.12, and this calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. Patient endurance and faithfulness. No matter what may come, we need to hold on to the teaching that we've received. Those stories of faith, stories of mercy, grace, forgiveness, repentance, God's justice, we need to hold on to those teachings. We need to grab a hold of that, those lessons. Hebrews 10 says, you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. We hang on so we reach maturity and faith, and get to be in his presence. The word is the teacher. The lesson is endurance. And the result, Paul says here in Romans 15, 4, is encouragement. The result is encouragement. Um, all the endurance, all the perseverance, that, that patient um, slogging through whatever comes is worthwhile if it takes place on a course that leads us to a good future, to a glorious future. And the encouragement provides exactly that assurance. The word that's used for encouragement uh, can mean sort of a, a, a range of things that are all kind of connected to one another. It can mean encouragement. It can mean um, 
comfort or consolation, um, admonition, uh, exhortation. There's, there are a lot of things that kind of go along with it. But we read in the New Testament that God is the source of all of it. He is the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. That's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1.3. The Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. That's the message that we teach and preach. Uh, in another passage in 1 Timothy 4.13 Paul is talking about preaching and teaching uh, and that it carries along the purposes of admonishing and encouraging people. That it's always supposed to be moving people in, in some way. Uh, I, I don't remember where I heard it. It was probably back in Bible college uh, at some point. Uh, we were told that one of the primary um, motivations in preaching and teaching is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. You need, you need healing. You need hope. Let the word of God preached and taught bring that to you. You're feeling pretty easy and good about things. Oh, let me turn up the heat a little bit. Make sure you know that um, it's time to start moving those toes because they're going to get stepped on. Not by James, but by God's word. Paul taught that um, those who prophesy, those who are teaching and preaching under the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit, that they are to, to strengthen. Um, the word means to build up or to edify. It really has to do with putting the roof on the top of the house. We're, we're supposed to build up the body of Christ to finish it off. Uh, he, he taught in 1 Corinthians 14 that we should be encouraging and exhorting the body of Christ, calling them to a new place, to, to go farther, to go higher, to go deeper, to not just be comfortable where they are. And Paul taught that the, uh, that the truth of God's word can bring comfort and consolation to the body of Christ. When we don't know what else to say, thankfully, God's word does. To speak under the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit refutes and teaches and reproves and admonishes and comforts and encourages the church. The, the word functions to build us all up together. One of the reasons that we have Bible studies and small groups who are working through passages of Scripture, uh, why we have vacation Bible school in the summer for children and youth group on Wednesday nights and other uh, other. Uh, devices to help you study the word on your own is not just so you get to be really good at being faithful to Jesus, but so that we all are brought together as we try to follow him. If there are churches that don't use this book very much, it's over here on the counter, but there are a million other great quotes and brilliant stories and touching things said, clever little devices if they're not using God's word, then what are they teaching? If that's where, where lessons are really learned from his word, then, then what is it that they are accomplishing? How can, how can there be any positive spiritual impact on anyone? Because if people won't read the account of God's faithfulness and, and forgiveness... How can they ever have enough heart to carry on through whatever it is that they're facing? You've got to be in this book. Because if we'll follow this teacher and learn the lessons, we'll find the result of encouragement. And the reaction that we should have to that is real hope. The joyful, confident expectation. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's First Thessalonians 1 3. There is a real connection between endurance and hope. Hope in Jesus, 
hope through Jesus is the one thing that can keep us moving forward through whatever valley, whatever bog, whatever mountain we may be dealing with. Our belief in the promises of God made real to us in Christ Jesus, that's what keeps us going. Hope is cultivated through the encouragement of God's word. He's given it to us, not just as something to memorize, not not for a tool to to whack people into submission, uh, to, to get people back in line. But it makes us wise for salvation. It teaches us. It gives us an understanding through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. I don't know what you do with your Bible. I don't know if um, if you actually have a, an, a real, for sure, physical Bible anymore, or if you just have an app on your phone. They're both great tools. But they won't do anything for you if they remain just like that. At some point after the first of the year, uh, we're going to try to do some special things that focus on God's Word. Uh, I've I've had a couple of brilliant ideas in the past that COVID kind of scuttled for me. Uh, And I'm I'm ready um, to, to kind of make those things unfold again. But I would I I cannot encourage you enough to make a plan and to follow through on it to get into God's Word. I don't care where you start uh, or how you start. You need to start. You got an app that'll give you a verse of the day, and you think about that. You read that. You pray about that. It comes back to you multiple times today. That is a much better place than where you might be right now, which is zero impact. You're already doing some? Push yourself a little bit more. You won't ever grow. You won't ever get stronger unless you're pushing and challenging yourself. If you're not doing any really deep study ever on your own, there's an excellent program here at Roy Christian Church where you can study with uh, masterful experts in God's Word. Not really. This is just me. <clears throat> but we, we learn a lot together. We get into why things are the way they are. We, we, we go to parallel passages. Um, you don't even have to come. You can find it all on YouTube. You can find it on uh, a Zoom call. You don't even have to get out of your pajamas to come and to study God's Word together. You need to have somebody with you, moving you, encouraging you, smacking you upside the head to remind you to get into this word because it changes us. That's what we need. We need to be changed by God through his revealed word. It is the thing that can bring us hope. You got hope in your spouse? Guess what? They're going to disappoint you. In your children or your parents? They're going to disappoint you. You have hope in your job. You got hope in the government. Oh, man, we will pray for you over and over again. There is no place else to put hope except into the one who always keeps his promises. Let's pray. Father, thank you for being with us through your Holy Spirit, through your word. And, and here in the presence of your people. We ask, Father, that if there are those who need to make a decision to follow you today, that they would do so without delay, that they would come and talk to me, they'd talk to Zach or one of the other church leaders to figure out what their next step in faith is. They need to stand up and, and, and recognize that Jesus is their Lord and Savior. They need to be immersed uh, to be washed and reborn. Um, they need to get back on track and to begin following you more faithfully. Whatever the step is, Lord, we pray that they will do that uh, without hesitation today. Father, we love your word. Sometimes it must be hard for you to tell that by the way that we treat it. But we pray, Lord, that you would increase the devotion we have to allowing your teacher to bring us life-changing lessons, encouragement, 
and hope for salvation. It's in the name of Christ Jesus we pray. Amen. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to ask if we could have a handful of men come this morning, four, uh, four gentlemen, if they come and uh, begin to serve the congregation, the elements uh, for communion. If you have uh, been watching from home, please be sure to grab your grape juice and bread uh, so you can partake with us in just a few moments. Ken Pink is going to come and share a few ideas with us about, uh, about communion. Good morning, everybody. I sounded really loud. Um, Jesus said, I'm going to wait a second, actually. Lapel too, Robert. Um, okay, yeah, better. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever he eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Lord's Supper is a way to celebrate our intimate connection and ongoing relationship with Jesus. There's no clear command in the, strict, in the scripture as to how often we're to receive the Lord's Supper. And for this reason, many churches have decided not to offer it weekly because they don't want it to become routine or lose its special status. The Lord's Supper isn't just special. It is the sacred centerpiece of our worship and our lives. <laughs> It reminds us of the supreme sacrifice Christ offered and the new covenant that's now been made to us, available to us through the shedding of his blood. In Acts 2.42, Luke explains that one of the key activities to which the early church was devoted as often as they gathered was the breaking of bread or the Lord's Supper. Luke also records in Acts 27, on the first day of the week we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and he intended to leave the next day, but kept talking on till midnight. Even though we're not commanded to observe communion each week, the teaching of Scripture indicates that believers shared the Lord's Supper often, as often as they gathered. It allows us to reflect on everything that comes before, before it and focused on Christ and his return as our eternal hope and joy. Celebrating the Lord's Supper at the close of each service service as a way of tying the service to the gospel. The table anchors the conclusion of the service and has a way of shaping all that comes before it, focusing on Christ and his return as our hope and joy. Shannon and I are grateful. We are part of a church family that shares the Lord's Supper each week. In our travels, we have been part of church families that have practiced monthly or quarterly we have found rather than feeling more special when we celebrated monthly or quarterly, we felt a deep and profound sense of loss and unease on the weeks that we did not. The Lord's Supper is special and, a, and is a core value of being a Christian. We should be thoughtful and grateful. We are part of a church family that values the table so highly. Let us pray. Father, it is important that we adhere to what your word says about the Lord's Supper. We are taking the bread and the cup, and will do so until Jesus comes again. We are forever grateful for the hope that has been given to me through his sacrifice. Thank you for the communion. Thank you that, I, that we are in a relationship with you. Our sins have been washed away, and we are now children of God. Uh, amen. In Mark's account of the Last Supper, in Mark 14, um, he gives us these words. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body. Take it. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Amen. I pray that you've been encouraged. 
that you've been challenged to walk and grow with Jesus while we've been together this morning. Uh, I'll close our live stream with these words from Paul, again to the Romans, actually just a few verses down from where we are this morning. Paul's prayer is, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We hope to see you all again very soon. Uh, That'll bring our stream to a close this morning. Band, if you would come up and lead us in a few more minutes.